This evening, we're back in Psalm 119, and certainly you can turn that up if you'd like. We're going to be looking at verses 89 through 96, and as usual, will be displayed on the screen behind me. Psalm 119. Let me go ahead and read the text as, uh, as we begin. The psalmist writes, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You establish the earth and it stands. They stand this day according to your ordinances, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have revived me. I am yours, save me. For I have sought your precepts. The wicked wait for me to destroy me. I shall diligently consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection. Your commandment is exceedingly broad. Uh, may the Lord bless His, um, His word to our uh, understanding this evening. By the way, um, I know sometimes as we read these sections, we might be tempted to think this is just sort of a, a string of random sayings, but um, they are actually all connected. And uh, you know how it is sometimes you, you get used to this, um, uh, this way of looking at Scripture, like it's a collection of, of these little you know, bits, like individual verses, and you pull your verse for the day out of the box and you read it. Uh, sometimes those verses actually mean something different when they're in their context, and, and we need to uh, take that into account. So context makes a difference, and we'll see, I think, something of that uh, this evening uh, in this passage, that these things really are related to one another and not just sort of random things that the psalmist is saying. Now, again, let me just remind you that last time we saw that the Lord fulfills His promises to us when we obey. Now, again, we're not talking about legalism here. We're talking about um, evangelical obedience, certain, uh, honoring the Lord because of what He has done for us. Your obedience doesn't earn anything, doesn't earn the blessings, doesn't bring them down. Your obedience merely shows that you have received the greatest blessing that God has to give, salvation, and shows that all the other blessings, which are a part of that package, that they belong to you as well. Now, remember that we are justified by grace through faith. When we talk about justification, we understand that we are saved by the works of Christ only. When we talk about salvation, we're actually talking about a much broader subject. It has everything to do with everything that God gives you through Christ. Christ has earned all of it for you. You know, you don't earn any of it. He earns it all. So we need to realize that we do need to obey to show that we are the heirs of the promise before we can actually ask God for the things that He has given. And, of course, we saw a couple of other things that are true of this as well, that if you are a believer and you are disobeying the Lord, uh, you may not receive His blessings when you ask for them because you might be under His discipline. Right? I mean, God's not going to bless you for disobedience. He withdraws blessings in order to get you to repent and to get you back on the right path uh, to teach you to obey Him. And He may also withdraw those blessings anyway because discipline is not always uh, corrective, but it, it's always instructive. And sometimes the Lord will simply withdraw His blessings in order to teach you to seek Him more earnestly. And don't forget as well, there is also the matter of His timing. Whenever we ask God for something and we are walking with Him in obedience, He hears us every single time, and Scripture tells us that we know that we have received from Him already what we've asked, but He's going to give it to us in His timing when He knows it is best for us. So there is the matter of discipline, there is the matter of timing, but generally speaking, when you walk with the Lord in obedience and you ask Him for His blessings. If you're delighting yourself in Him, if you're loving Him more than anything else, which is a part of your obedience, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself, when you seek Him for what He has promised, He will answer you. He will give those things to you. 
But now the question we want to look at this evening that's a part of what we're looking at in this text is just how obedient do you have to be in order to receive the promises of God? Now we're talking here about our practical, personal obedience. Does God require that we be absolutely perfect before He's going to give us what it is that He has promised? I think you know the answer to that question already. The answer is no, you don't have to be perfect, otherwise you would never have them, at least not in this life, which is when you need them. You can't be perfect. Uh, That's why God sent His Son into the world in the first place, why His Son obeyed perfectly, why He came down to earn the blessings for you is because you can't be perfect. You don't have to be perfect, but on the other hand, let's not forget this, you still have to try to be perfect because that's what the grace of God does in the heart of believers. It makes you want to be like Jesus, and Jesus was absolutely perfect. I hope we're not shooting for an imperfect Jesus as far as our example God has given to us a perfect example in in Jesus, and that's what we, by the grace of God, should desire to be like. So we don't have to be personally perfect, but we do have to desire to be perfect. Now, this evening, what I'd like to do is consider three things from this passage. And again, as I said, I don't think they're just strung together randomly. I I do believe that there is logic, (laughs) there is a reasonable uh, order to what he's talking about. Now, first of all, the first thing we want to see is that that God will hear your prayers. He will give you His promises, but all of His his grace is is ultimately based on Him, on His faithfulness, and not on yours, okay? And I think that's what He's arguing in the first part. Secondly, the evidence that the promises belong to you, again, as I've already said, is your delight in and obedience to His law. That is the evidence that you are the heir of His promises. If you don't have that, you really can't expect God to hear you. And then finally, God will give you what He has promised, even though your obedience is always going to be less than perfect. You don't have to be perfect to receive what God has given. So first of all, let's look at the fact that God hears your prayers and answers you. He gives you His promises based on His faithfulness and not based upon what you do. Okay, now actually the fact that God will give you His promises based on several things that are true about Him. First, on the fact that God is eternal. And I think that's what's behind um, what the author is, is saying in verse 89. He says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Why is God going to give you what He has promised? Well, first of all, it's because God eternally exists to do that. If God's going to be faithful, you know, He has to be able to exist long enough to do that. And we know from Scripture certain things about God that lend themselves to His being faithful. One of them is the fact that He has no beginning and He has no end. God always has been, God always will be, which means that He will always exist to fulfill what He has promised, which is why His Word is settled forever, because God is eternal. Now, secondly, God's faithfulness in fulfilling His promises is also based on the fact that God Himself will never change. God will always be exactly the same as He is right now, because again, as I've mentioned, God never changes. Now, let me just mention one thing. There's a lot of, I've heard this a number of times through, through uh, the churches that I've been in, in my own life before, you know, I, I went into the ministry and then, of course, didn't hear other sermons on a regular basis like I used to, but I used to hear this a lot. And that is, uh, you know, that, that the, the God that we have to do with is no longer as He was under the old covenant, you know, we look at the Old Testament and sometimes we think, well, God was kind of a bit, you know, a bit more angry back then. He was kind of poured out His judgment a little bit more than He seems to now. And, and it seems like since He's given us His Son, He's just a lot more gracious 
in the new covenant than he used to be. And I've even heard ministers say that that is the case. But I want you to realize that God never changes. The God we worship is exactly the same God of the Old Testament, the same God of the new covenant as well. Uh, the fact that he has given us his son is simply an expression of that infinite love that he has always had and always will have. God does not change. Now, what that means is if God has promised that he's going to do something, then he's going to do it, and he's not going to change. The psalmist says in verse 90, your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. God's faithfulness will never change because God never changes, so he is eternal and he is unchangeable. Now, thirdly, God is going to fulfill His promises, I believe the psalmist is telling us, because He has the power to do it. I mean, what good would it be if, if God is eternal and unchangeable, but He's completely powerless to fulfill what He has promised? The psalmist points to the fact that God established the earth. He created basically everything that there is, and it continues to stand to this day because God has infinite power. He says in verses 90 and 91, you establish the earth and it stands. They stand, and I think he means by they, the heavens and the earth, they stand this day according to your ordinances. Now, if God can speak the universe into existence with a word and if he can keep it in existence for as long as he has already, and I, I'll just say in passing, I do believe it's, it's not eons of ages, but basically 6,000 years, the Lord has the power to fulfill His promises. God can do it because He is unlimited in His power. And by the way, the universe doesn't even display His unlimited power because it's not infinite. Only God is infinite. It's just a fraction. I mean, it's really nothing of what He is actually capable of doing. And then fourthly, God will fulfill His promises because He has absolute sovereignty over everything that He has made. He is in control, which is, of course, what you would expect from one who has infinite power, infinite knowledge, who is eternal and unchangeable. Basically, the psalmist tells us that He is in control of everything in verse 91. It's funny because up until the time I prepared this sermon, I always read this one uh, clause differently. He says, "'For all things are your servants.'" I thought what he meant by that is everything belongs to your servants. You've created the, the earth and you've given it to your, to your servants. It belongs to them. But that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that all things serve you. Everything is your servant. Everything is under your absolute sovereignty. Notice uh, if this had meant the first thing, there would have been an apostrophe after servants that belongs to you, but it doesn't. All things serve the Lord. They all obey Him. Now, the psalmist is telling us that God's eternality, His unchangeableness, His infinite power, and His sovereignty are the reasons why His promises cannot fail. And, of course, we need to add to this that in the sovereign, eternal plan of God, He purposed to send His Son into the world in order to purchase these blessings, in order to bring them down to us. And understanding if God was willing to give you what was most precious to Him, which is His Son, how could He then withhold anything from you of what He has promised? He gave you what was most precious to bring these promises down to you. So all these promises are ultimately based on God's faithfulness, which is based, of course, upon all the things that we've just looked at. So why does the psalmist look to the Lord and expect to receive these things? Because of these things we've looked at, his, his faithfulness ultimately based on eternality, unchangeableness, uh, absolute power, and sovereignty. Now, secondly, the psalmist is saying that the evidence, and we've looked at this before, but he again continues to expound this because he wants us to see it. The evidence that you can lay claim to the faithfulness of God and these promises is your delight and your obedience to His commandments. Now, he says this in, in various ways. Look at verse 92. He says, if your law had not been my delight, 
then I would have perished in my affliction. Why did the Lord come to the psalmist rescue and deliver him from this particular difficulty, from this particular affliction? It's because he kept the law, because he delighted in the law, because he loved the Lord and he wanted to obey him. And because he kept the law, God was faithful to him and did not allow him to perish. Now, again, don't understand this as legalism. This isn't something that he earned by his obedience, but rather by his, his delight in the law, he showed that he was already an heir of those particular blessings. He kept the law because he delighted in it, because his heart had already been changed by God's grace. The, the natural man, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, does not delight in the law of God it says that he hates God and he won't submit to God because he, he can't, he won't. He's in rebellion against him. So this is not a natural man pleasing God through his own obedience and receiving the blessings of God. It's a man who shows that his heart has been changed by the grace of God, the fact that he delights in the law of God. It shows he's a child of God. And because he's a child, God delivered him because God comes to the rescue of His children. This is all purely of God's grace. So again, when you obey the Lord, you not only show that you are His, but you also show that you have a right to His promises. You can lay claim to them. You can ask God and you can know that He's going to answer you because you delight in the commandments of God. Now, secondly, he tells us how much he delights in these commandments. He loved them so much that he vowed never to forget these commandments. Look at verse 93. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have revived me. Now, the word forget doesn't mean that I'm just going to remember what God said and just go on my merry way and do what I want to do but that he would remember them to do them. In every situation, in all circumstances, he would remember what it is that God said that apply to it, and he would make sure that he did it. This is exactly the same thing we see in the New Covenant, isn't it? When Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Uh, the, the Lord and his law are basically inseparable. If you love one, you have to love the other because one is the expression of the other. One thing that Jonathan Edwards points out in, in his writings, which I think is very insightful, is that the reason why the Christian loves God, the reason why he loves Jesus Christ is not because of the way he looks, it's not because of his infinite power, it's not because of his infinite knowledge, it's not because he's everywhere at once and eternal because if all those things were true of God, and yet he were evil, he wouldn't be lovely, would he? He'd be the greatest monster that you could conceive of, and you would be afraid of him for that reason. The thing that makes God lovely is the fact that he is holy. And really, the law of God is an expression of that holiness. And that is what the believer loves God for, is that holiness. And remember that what, the, what that holiness actually is. It is love of what is right, love of what is good. The law of God, which is an expression of His holiness, can be summarized by the word love. Loving God and loving your neighbor, as we saw this morning, that's what Jesus did. He was holy. And again, that shows us how wicked sin is. That natural man would hate God's law, would not want to submit to it, when all it really requires is that we love God and that we love our neighbor as ourselves. But that is what natural man does not want to do. So again, if we are going to love God, we will also love His commandments. And since that is the case, we will make sure that we don't forget them. We will make sure that we keep them. Now, the psalmist said that he also wouldn't forget them because they were a means of reviving his soul. Does anybody here need their soul revived? We, we need that daily, don't we? because we continually are drifting, as it were, from the Lord. The law of God can actually help draw us closer to the Lord. It can actually revive us. 
Now, how can it do that? Well, because it constantly, first of all, reminds us of how much we need the Lord Jesus Christ in order to keep the law. When we read the law of God and we look at our lives and we see how far we, short, we fall short of what the Lord calls us to be, we realize we can't do it on our own. So we seek the Lord for more of His Holy Spirit in order to keep it. That's certainly one way that it, it can revive us. And the other way is by continually showing us what is pleasing to God and what is displeasing to God, it shows you how you can honor Him. It shows you how you can keep from grieving the Spirit of God, quenching His work. And as, again, as long as you walk in the commandments of God, you will constantly be strengthened by the Spirit of God. Every time you, you step out of the way, every time you sin against the Lord, every time you compromise, it costs you something spiritually. Just, just examine your life. I mean, you're, you're going to sin again. I'd like to say, you know, don't sin and, and, and believe that we're all going to do that. But that's not the case, is it? We're all going to sin. Next time you sin, you know, and that, that's going to happen before the service is over. It's actually happening right now. But next time, next time you sin, <laughs> um, just examine yourself and see what it does to your heart. See what it does to your mind. See how it draws you away from the Lord. See how it weakens you. And see how it also shows you how much you need to be revived again. How you need to have the grace of God enlivened in you so that you can love Him again and serve Him the way you want, uh, the way that you really desire. So the law of God is a means of reviving. So the psalmist loves God. He doesn't want to forget the commandments because he loves Him. He wants to do them, but he also wants to do them because he knows that by so doing, it will continually revive him. That's one of the means God gives to us. Uh, again, the means of grace we talk about, prayer and the Word of God and worship and singing and uh, those types of things, fellowship. Obedience is one thing that will revive us. The more we obey, the more the Lord will grant us His grace and strength, and the more we sin, the more He's going to withdraw, and it's, the more we're going to struggle. So this is why the psalmist wanted to keep uh, and remember the law of God. And then thirdly, on the basis of, of his obedience, the psalmist lays claim to being a son of God, to sonship, and also to God's promise. Look at verse 94. He says, I am yours. Save me, for I have sought your precepts. Now, the psalmist says that I am yours. On what basis does he say that? He says, I am yours because I've sought your precepts. I know that I belong to you. Okay, again, that is the evidence that he belongs to him. It's the evidence that he is trusting in the Son of God. Remember that, that Old Testament saints were saved the same way that New Testament saints are saved, and that's by trusting in Jesus Christ. It's just that in the Old Testament, he was given to them by way of promise and by way of, of pictures of sacrifices and prophecies and things like that. And he, he gave a prophecy regarding the Messiah at, at, the, at the fall. So there is always, sinners have always had a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who believed the promise of God and looked forward to Him and trusted in Him were saved by Him, just as we are in the new covenant. We look back. They were looking forward. So... He is a son of God. He knows that he is because he's trusting the Messiah. He sees the evidence because he is actually obeying him. And that's the same way that we can know that we're sons and daughters. And the same way that we know that we are, again, going to receive what it is that God has promised to us, salvation and all the other blessings, because we obey him. I just draw your attention to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10 where the Lord, through the author to the Hebrews, is contrasting the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. And he says the Old Covenant uh, was, was basically the law of God written on stone. And he said, the people to whom I gave it did not follow it. They didn't continue in it, so I didn't care for them, said the Lord. But this is the covenant that I'm going to make. I'm going to take my law and I'm going to put it in their minds and I'm going to write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. In the new covenant, God actually writes that law in our hearts, as it were. He, he gives us a love for it so that we will do it. It gives us the power 
uh, to keep those commandments. So again, that is how we know that we are part of the new covenant. That's how we know that we have trusted in Jesus Christ is that we, we love the law and we obey the law just like Jesus did. Remember I said this morning as parents, you know, we, we pray for our children and we keep praying for them until we see Christ formed in them. Well, how can we know that Christ is being formed in them? It's when we see them walking according to the commandments of God. Now, remember here when the psalmist says to the Lord, I am yours, save me, he's not saying save my soul, I'm, I'm unconverted, please deliver me, because he already knows the Lord. He already has salvation. Rather, he's looking to the Lord for the fulfillment of his promise to save him from his enemies. I would have perished in my affliction if I hadn't, you know, obeyed the Lord, if I hadn't delighted in your law. That affliction is what he wanted salvation from his enemies. As we've seen again and again through these different sections, there's somebody that's attacking uh, the psalmist, the arrogant, uh, who would destroy him. But the Lord is delivering him, and the reason is because he belongs to him and he knows that he does because he keeps his commandments. So the point here again is when you obey the Lord, it gives you the confidence to plead his promises and know that you will receive them because you know they belong to you because you know God has had mercy on you. And so, fourthly, that's why his response to, the, to this danger is obedience. Look at verse 95. The wicked wait for me to destroy me. I shall diligently consider your testimonies. Now, you might, you might think, you know, that the response would be a little bit different. The wicked wait for me to destroy me, so I'm going to run into this room and lock the door. I'm going to go into this strong tower and and hide, you know, myself from my enemy, maybe that's our response. I'll take self-defense lessons, you know, I'll learn how to use a sword or whatever so I can defend myself against them. But that's not the psalmist's response, is it? Because he knew that his safety ultimately depended upon the Lord and not on his own ability, that the Lord was ultimately in control. So rather, he set his heart to obey the Lord, to diligently seek Him for His well, to, to consider his testimonies and to do what he said. You know, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about uh, the, the example, perhaps you're aware of it historically, of uh, Stonewall Jackson. And uh, perhaps you know why he was called Stonewall Jackson, because uh, when he was uh, in, in a battle, uh, he would sit on his horse right out in the open where anybody could shoot him. <laughs> and he, you know, he, he would sit there and he wouldn't move. And bullets were flying all around him, and none of them seemed to hit him. <laughs> but he, was, he, was, he looked like a stone wall. He, he was unmoving, unflinchable. And the reason why he was is because he trusted the Lord. He obeyed the Lord, and he knew his life was in God's hand, ultimately his safety. He, he said on one occasion, he goes, I'm just as safe out here in the battlefield sitting on my horse as I am sleeping in my bed at night. I'm just as safe because I'm in God's hands. Now, I don't know that we would follow that philosophy necessarily, that we would put ourselves in, in harm's way. Uh, he did, and the Lord blessed him for it. Um, but that's the kind of trust that we ought to have in the Lord. If we are obeying the Lord, if we are walking with Him, if we're trusting Christ and we have that evidence in our lives through our repentance and our obedience, then we should know that our lives are in His hands. We should not worry, but trust the Lord. And if we see some kind of difficulty or danger, then our response should be to make sure we draw near to the Lord, make sure we're walking with Him. That's really all we need to do. And God will do everything else, and He'll lead us into what it is we need to do to remain safe. So again, first we've seen that God's answering His or giving to us His promises are ultimately based upon Him. But we can know that we're the heirs of the promise through our obedience to Him. So the, but the final point is this. You know, granted that these things are true that you need to obey in order to receive God's promises, do you have to obey perfectly? I believe the answer, of course, must be no because you can't do it for one thing. But he points that out again and again in Scripture. He will give you what He has promised even though your obedience is less than perfect. And I believe that's what the psalmist has in mind in verse 96. He says, I have seen a limit 
to all perfection. Your commandment is exceedingly broad. Now, I think what the psalmist is saying here is that as he looks at all of God's creation, as he looks at all of his creatures, particularly his moral creatures, those that are capable of obedience, and even more specifically when he looks at himself and he understands what it is that God actually requires in, in the commandments, his commandment being exceedingly broad, that it, it regulates not only what we actually do, but as our Lord told us in the Sermon on the Mount, what we think and what we say and what we intend, what we desire in our hearts, that they require absolute perfection. He sees that everything falls short. All creaturely perfection is less than perfection. I've seen a limit, he says, to all of it. Not to God's perfection, obviously, because He is perfect. And there's no limit to that. So what he has to have in mind here is creaturely perfection. Everything falls short, especially when you understand the breadth of God's commandments. He sees he can only go so far in his obedience that he cannot reach perfection. Now, does that mean that he can't have the promises then that God has made because he can't obey perfectly? Does it mean you can't? receive what God has promised because you're not perfect either? Does that mean you can't be saved? Does that mean that everything else God has promised is is out of your reach forever? No, because Jesus has obeyed perfectly. He not only can, but He has. He deserves what it is that God has promised, and Jesus gives those things to you as a gift of His grace if you only trust Him. Now, that's true of salvation, but that's true of everything else. Remember, salvation is a package. It includes all the blessings that Jesus has purchased through His life and His death. He has bought them all, and He gives them to you as a free gift by His grace. You receive it by faith. You do have to trust God. You do have to trust Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Turn from your sins. But then you have to trust God for every single one of His blessings based upon what Jesus Christ has done. He has purchased it, and you can claim it on the basis of what He has done. But now let's not forget the other part because that almost sounds like a license to sin, doesn't it? But it isn't. If you can receive the promises because of what Jesus has done, does that mean you don't have to obey? I hope you don't arrive at that conclusion especially after everything we've seen in this particular psalm, you have to obey. You personally have to obey if you are to receive the promises. I mean, Jesus did the work. Everything is purely of His grace. But His work is not just the work He did on earth in purchasing those blessings for you. His work is also in you. Uh, He's the one who qualifies you by His grace to receive these blessings. He has given you His Spirit to clean your life up from the inside out so that you will obey Him, so that you can receive the promises. So this too is by His grace. Now sadly, not being perfectionists, we do understand that this doesn't mean that He's going to make you perfect while you're here on earth in your practice because you still have sin, you still have the old man, you still have remaining corruption that the Lord tells you that you need to put to death and as long as you have it, it's going to be interjecting itself into everything that you do and making you less than perfect. It doesn't mean that you have to be perfect. Jesus' work in you is not going to be perfect, so you don't have to be perfect before you can believe God's going to answer your prayers. But It does mean that you do have to obey to some degree and that you do have to be growing in that obedience because the work that Jesus Christ does in the hearts of His children is to make them desire perfect obedience. That's something that is true of every believer. That that desire may be strong, it may be weak depending upon how much of the Spirit you have in you. It depends upon how closely you've been walking with Him according to His commandments and obeying Him. The more you obey Him and use the means of grace, the stronger that desire will be. 
The less you do, the, the weaker that desire will be, but that desire for perfection will always be there because that is what the Spirit of God produces. So no, you don't have to be perfect to receive the blessings, but you do have to desire perfection and you do need to be doing as much as you can to obey the Lord. And again, you'll do it because you want to do it because that's what the Spirit of God works within you. So again, let's be encouraged through these things that we can have the promises of God. We can receive them. We can receive them because of, of God and because of who He is. As we saw, His, His eternality, the fact that He's unchangeable, all-powerful, and sovereign. He has given us His Son who has purchased these promises for us, and He will give them to us because that is what He has decided to do in His mercy and grace and in His loving kindness. And even though you have to obey them in order to receive them, if you're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, He will be working in you to fulfill that, those commandments so that you can receive them. He will qualify you to receive them. And even though you fall short of perfection, He will still give them to you because it's not your obedience that actually earns them. It's the obedience of Jesus who obeyed perfectly. So through this, as we think about, again, Spurgeon's book, Only a Prayer Meeting, and all the different things that are in there with regard to what needs to be true of us, in order to use the checkbook that the Lord has given to us, His Word with all the different promises in it, let's remember that obedience is one of those qualifications. But don't forget, Jesus is the one who is working that in you if you are trusting Him. He will make sure that you are qualified. But again, let's not forget sanctification is cooperative. You know, He's working in us, but we also need to be working along with Him and agreeing with Him. We need to be seeking to obey Him. We need to be using the means of grace. And as we do, the Lord will give us then uh, the grace we need to grow and lay hold of His promises and receive them. That's a tremendous blessing. It's very encouraging. Let's pray that the Lord will grant that we might be able to do that. Well, let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask that um, He would help us to obey more carefully so that we can lay hold of these promises.